I'd like to take you back to the year 1989. MASH? Magnum? <laughs> MacGyver? Was MacGyver on? No, no. I'd like you to take you back to a familiar scene to those of us who grew up in townships across South Africa um, and who also were familiar to the township protests of that decade and that time. By now, most of us, even if we haven't grown up in townships, have a visual reference to go with that phrase, township protest, toito. You kind of have an idea in your head. But I'd like to paint you a little bit of a picture of a toitoi from the viewpoint of an eight-year-old girl living in New Brighton township outside of Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape. It begins with a warm sound. It's, it's a kind of a hum. And the sound builds and it builds and it builds. I'm standing in the kitchen. I'm washing the dishes. It's after lunch. And I turn to the open kitchen door. From my door, I see a multitude. I see an ocean of brown wave after wave of people flowing down my street. Now, this hum becomes a roar. And this roar becomes a call, a song. A call with an answer. And it's something like this. Hey, ta ta, a ta ta ta. Hey, ta ta, a ta ta ta. Hey, ta 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 ta. Hey, ta 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 ta. ta. Good luck, Kichima. Ta, Kichima. Ta, ta. Good luck, Kichima. Ta, Kichima. Ta, ta. Hey, oh Mandela, you so, you soldier. Oh Mandela, you so, you soldier. What do I do? Eight-year-old me, I'm watching open-mouthed as these people are rushing past me. This ocean, the sea is coming towards me. This song is building, building. I open my mouth and I release the song and I'm in the throng. I am in it, in the machine. I am part of every single living thing linked in. Now, let's fast forward to 2013. I'm in New York City. I'm pregnant with my very first child, and uh, I'm, we're certain that it's a, it's, a, it's a little girl, but a few months down the line, we get a huge surprise. It's a boy. <laughs> now, I'm in a tiny little annex of a theater, and I'm playing with my band, Freshly Ground. As mentioned, we're playing a little family matinee show. And this matinee show has, we're playing to two-year-olds all the way up until, I think the oldest kid there must have been 12 or something, and with their families. And uh, this, this little theater, well, this big theater is the Apollo Theater uptown in Harlem. And I must say, it definitely was a feeling of having arrived. I mean, the Apollo Theater, this is the stuff of dreams for musicians. And here we are in this tiny little theater, and uh, we're playing this gig. It's sort of a stripped-down version of a gig, but it's with no less energy than we usually give in our performances. And in no time, you've got these tiny little people. You know, they're kind of moving around in very uncoordinated, you know, kind of slightly spastic. Sorry to use that term if it's, if it's not PC. But they're kind of moving across the dance floor, and it was just the sweetest thing. It was such a such a moment to see, to, to behold. And towards the end of the performance, I ask the audience if they got any questions. Immediately, this little kid, he's about seven or eight years old, he shoots up his hand, and yo, he's animated. He's extremely excited. I mean, he's hopping around from foot to foot. He's doing a toy toy himself. You know, it's like he's on hot coals. He's like, ah, ah, I've, I've got a question. I, I mean, I, I, I mean the music and the sound. 
sound and the lights and how does it all, I mean, it's so wonderful. How do you put it all together? It's so wonderful. What a compliment. Best compliment we've ever received. Now, the most interesting thing for me, what struck me about that, that experience and that exchange was the sense of wonder, the sense of curiosity, the appreciation this kid had at seeing the harmony on stage, at feeling the connectedness from the stage to the audience. It made me, of course, super excited to meet, to meet the little person inside my belly, my little girl. Um, <laughs> you know, and to see and to witness her growing wonder, her growing sense of, wow, this world, you know, as she grew up, as he grows up. But it also brought home to me, my eight-year-old self in the townships in New Brighton all of those years ago, back to 1989. 1989, it was the year of the very last whites-only election in this country. It was a decade of blood, flames, horror all across our townships. And this did bleed over into the urban areas which led the government to decree two states of emergency, declare two states of emergency in short succession in that decade. It was also the year after my mother died in a government hospital. And the trauma of that loss, it rendered my father practically mute for years when he was at home. And I'll tell you why, you see, the year before, he had been expecting to bring home my mother and their newborn child, their fourth, in their marriage. But that was not to be. Tragically, mistakenly, they never were ever to make it home again. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about my dad. I mean, he's, he was and still is a very well-loved figure in my community. He's like that guy, you know? <laughs> oh, he's that dude. Everybody, he, he'll always want to know how you are, how your family is, huh? How is Auntie so-and-so? What's your clan? How are you connected to that person? How is that person connected to me? Oh my God, it drove us up the wall. Up the wall, walking with my father in the streets was a nightmare. He was practically planting family trees, plotting family trees all across the way home. <laughs> it was very embarrassing and it was very tedious. But I do so much appreciated now. It gave me such a feeling of safety and security in the world. Because what it taught me was that if we all are connected to each other somehow by, by however many degrees of separation, then nobody's ever really a stranger and that we're all among friends. Now, I was aware that all was not well in my community. There were constant stayaways from school. There were constant stayaways from work if you were older. Um, and of course, the presence of Caspers, which were the, the armored military trucks, you know, that the police used to roll in and the army used to roll in in the townships. They were all, all too familiar as was the sting of tear gas used to break up crowds. However, my father never spoke to us about the political situation in the country. He never ever sat us down and explained, this is what is going on on high and this is how it's affecting us down here. In fact, after my mother died, he sent us to multiracial schools. That's why I speak with such a nice accent. <laughs> He sent us to multiracial schools and he encouraged us to see people not only as equal but, but as family and to be curious about people. 
So why I find this, why I find it remarkable that he never said anything to us is, I mean, knowing now what, what I know now, is his experience in those days and for much of his life living under a white government and amongst his countrymen, many of whom were taught to see him and interact with him as a boy, as an inferior, as a less than. My father, my proud Kosa father. He never let this on. This sense of curiosity that he fostered in us and the sense of connection to other human beings encouraged me or inspired me to write songs and continues to do so. It helps me to listen to the voices within me and to tell their stories. It gives me a platform to experience real harmony. There's a moment, like that moment at the Apollo, that little boy where the audience and the stage are absolutely one. I call it my moment of the closed circle where everybody is joined together in a moment, yes, as I said before, of real harmony. I've been around the world with my band from streets in Tokyo where I was surprised and delighted by speakers, speakers, as you walk down the street, playing this tranquil, beautiful music. It's like really chilled, amazing stuff too. Zimbabwe, high-flying moments on stage, incredibly energetic shows too, being thrown out of Zimbabwe, yes. Um, <laughs> to 2010, to opening the World Cup here. Oh, I mean, what a dream. It's been quite a ride and I feel incredibly privileged to be a part of bringing people together and to bring myself closer to the global community, my global community. How these connect, I feel like for that, that boy in New York, that's exactly what he recognized, that moment of connection. My eight-year-old self in New Brighton, when I dove into that crowd, that's what I was wanting to experience. It is the reason that we must all keep creating, whether it's art or whether we're designing or building bridges, it's all the same. This world is our home and its people, our family. Uma mulher jabula, uma mulher jabu, uma mulher jabula, uma mulher jabu. Didi ko kandi fige kaya, didi ko kandi fige kaya. Did he go by the kaya? Did he go by the kaya? Ingos ka cool. How many of you know the song Nom Vula that we released on one of our? Yeah? Not enough of you, I don't think. <laughs> but I'll do it because actually it, 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 uh, it's a thank you song to my father and my mother, so I'll do a little bit of it for you. So nelam shobo wa nali baleli de abo kwa kala ko nengata zo 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 na kuli swango ise wa o aswele kelo esemcha ngudali wa ke umama wa uidis. Nomvula Thomas Maola Ai na sangue saibona indo menche a kuliswa indo da lami na masangue baibona indo masanenche a kuliswa indo. Nali baleli de 
Abo kwa talako ni nkatazo zo zo Siabulela Awesome